Well, well thank you, Tom. I, I appreciate everyone coming today, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, you know, the first thing I thought when Tom asked me to come speak was like, I looked and I thought, okay, this would be a cool deal. I'll go speak to the people. And then he sent out the list of people who are going to be presenting each week, and I'm going like, why would he ask me to be here? There's some really smart people on that list besides <laughs> me, so you have to kind of take what you get. And then I decided that, you know, I was probably, you probably couldn't find anybody else. So I was down there, and the only two people below me on the list were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. So. <laughs> But no, seriously, I, I am glad to be here. Uh, I have spent about 35, almost 36, 37 years in the food business, uh, running different companies. I actually started in the food business in Portland, Oregon, lived in Portland for 10 years, and I've lived in Southern California, Wisconsin, Indianapolis, Indiana. Now I live in Park City, Utah. And I commute back and forth almost every week. Two questions I usually get from people are, one, how'd you get in the food business? Well, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and it was truly what they called subsistence farms back in the 60s, because you barely subsisted on a dairy farm. And uh, so I always say I've been in it since dirt, I guess. I don't know. I was probably where I got my start. And then people always say, well, how'd you get successful? How did you get where you are today? And I know the answer to that question very clearly fear of farming, because I ain't never farming again in my life, although my wife keeps dragging me back into it, but farming is a, is a tough way to get, to get around. Uh, my, my background really is I've been president and CEO of five different businesses since 1986, uh, some as small as 15 or 20 million, and the largest was about 1.2 billion public company. Um, I basically... Most of the time when you get a job going into a new company, there's a reason you're going in, because most of them are turnaround situations. My mother always said, can't you keep a job? But um, I, I went to businesses, most of them were struggling or had some type of issues, and we got them turned around. And one thing in life that's important to know is, as you look on, you, know, you have to realize what you're good at and what you're not good at. And I'm good at building a business. I ain't worth a shit running it uh, the long term because I, I get bored with it or something, I don't know, and I always have to look for something different, I guess. But I never really worried about my next job, I just tried to worry about doing the best job I could at the pl job I had now, and the next job always seems to, to take care of itself. And then last but not least, I'm a brand builder. I love brands, I love the connections brands make with people, and, and I love building a brand and, and, and taking that brand and making it making it something special versus things. So, so I'm very focused on brands. I'm not really very good with private label or other things. If you got questions on that kind of stuff, I'm probably not your guy. Um, Johnny's brief history. Johnny's has been here, you know, since in the Northwest since the 40s. Johnny was a meat cutter up on the docks of Seattle, developed his seasoning salt started selling spices at the World's Fair in 1962, and they opened the, what's that, base needle thing up there? And uh, uh, he was a character. Johnny lived life to the fullest. Uh, there, there's no shortage of that. And he died uh, around 2000, 1998, 99. He was 94 years old, came into the office every day, still to that day. And then his grandson uh, ended up with the business. And uh, we bought it from his grandson and another person in 2011. We'll do about 20 million this year in annual revenue. We have about 42 employees, 40,000 square feet. We're located right over by the Tacoma Dome and the train station, big yellow sign right there. Uh, we don't have anything to do with the restaurants. The restaurants, John still owns the restaurants. We sell in every state in the United States, uh, the US, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Australia, UK, and a little bit in South Korea. Uh, we sell all the major customers in the grocery business, Costco, Walmart, Kroger, Safeway, Sam's, SARS, anybody you can think of we'll sell to. We don't care who they are. We're, we're, we're in all, we sell anybody anything. Um, our products, our two main products, well, one of them is seasoning salt, which people are most familiar with. We're the number two brand of seasoning salt in the U.S., and we are the fastest growing seasoning salt brand in the United States. And I thought I had told them to put some au jus samples in the box, but we have a little white jug of au jus 
that we sell that we are the number one liquid au jus in the United States. In fact, we have a 95% market share of the au jus, liquid au jus business in the United States. Of course, we're the only liquid au jus in the United States, so I don't know where the other 5% belongs. I can't figure it out. Uh, and then we do a, a full range of spices from salmon to steak to all these things, as well as um, a salad dressing line, mostly which we sell to Costco. Most of it's sold to club. Most of it's sold outside of the United States. About 30% of our business is done export, well, what would be considered export business, almost all with Costco in countries like Australia and Mexico, Canada, the UK, those places. At Johnny's, we, we have, our mission is we don't make your meal, we just make your meal taste better. Our job's to provide the flavor for your meal and to give you a better dining experience. And every person at Johnny's every day, when they get up and come in in the morning and they go home at night, spends their time focusing on what can we do to make your food taste better. That's our mission in life, that's what we do. And the one thing I would say is I, I think, that actually stole that line from BASF, all those that watch the old BASF commercials, by the way. But, um, but what we do is we really focus we, we try to narrow in and focus on our niche and what we do. I think one of the things in business, and especially small business, and I see it with entrepreneurs all the time, man, I got this great taco sauce, I got this, I got that. You gotta keep yourself honed in. You gotta stay focused on your consumer. You gotta know who you're dealing with and, and why you're in the business. You know, I kind of have, I, I like to keep things simple. All we wanna do is sell more and spend less. If we can do those two things, we will be successful. And if you're not contributing to one of those two things, then you don't have a place in our company, is the way I always tell people. So you have to evaluate what you're doing, but you're either helping us sell more, or you're finding a way to do it cheaper and less expensively, or otherwise we probably don't need you and your job is in jeopardy. Um, and, and last but not least, we're a sales-driven company. We, we focus on the top line. Not that we don't make money, but our goal is to build a brand and to expand the brand across the United States. So we're very focused on, on revenue and um, customer attraction and those kind of things. So the theme today was building a business and taking it to the next level. And we'll come back to Johnny's a little more in a second. But, you know, I, I wrote down, what does it take to build a, build a company the root away? Because um, as my CFO always says, there's gap and then there's wrap, which are the root accounting principles. But, uh, <laughs> But, but we, we, we are very aggressive and, and we move that way. And, and the first thing I look at when I look at a business or there is, is, is you gotta have passion. You gotta have passion. If you wanna run a business, if you wanna run a business, it's a 24 seven job. It doesn't start at eight, doesn't go home at five. It lives with you constantly. My sales manager, Jim Starr, who's been with me through this is second company, he always says when he gets, oh, gets up in the morning and he sees that email from me that came in at 3.30 a.m., he knows it's going to be a long day. But, you know, you, you've got to be passionate about your business. You've got to talk to your consumers. I'm in a grocery store four or five times a week. I stop grocery stores constantly. I do probably 90%, well, not 90%, I do a lot of shopping for our house. Uh, because you've got to be talking to consumers, you've got to be out touching and feeling them and feeling the pulse and seeing what's going on in the world. The second thing you have to have if you want to have a good business is you've got to have great product. You've got to have great product. I can sell anybody anything once, but to sell them twice, it's got to taste good. And in the food business, people eat what tastes good. Don't ever shit your, fool yourself on something else. Yeah, they'll buy this stuff out here once. I've seen fat-free, low-fat, no-fat, ton of fat, cholesterol, no cholesterol. I've seen it all over the last 36 years of trends that have taken place in this business. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they eat what tastes good and they want it to be good for them. So you've got to hit those two criteria, but you, 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 you've got to make it taste good. That's the only way things resell. Um, two, you've got to understand who your consumer is. I had someone ask me earlier about do we sell in Whole Foods. I'm sorry, Johnny's is not Whole Foods, okay? We like Whole Foods, we'd sell to them if we can, but our product is middle America. We sell families, we sell people, we sell working people, we sell what I call the average American. We're kind of meat and potatoes kind of company. 
And, and I, I always kind of tell this one story about understanding your consumer. When, I don't know, this was maybe 1999, I had been running the Beatrice side of ConAgra and we merged some stuff and they wanted me to move to Omaha, Nebraska. And I said, I'm not moving to friggin' Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Any of you guys ever been there? Don't. <laughs> anyway, and uh, I had a friend who wanted me to, there's a company called Gardenburger. I don't know if most of you have heard of Gardenburger out of Portland, Oregon, it's been, been around, was around, and Gardenburger hit the scene and selling these vegetarian burgers and, and they went out and created an aura of a market that wasn't near as big as what it was, but they spent $80 million and then they fired the guys and it was, it was a problem, but they were looking for somebody to come in and take it over. And I went and visited with them and I spent time and we sampled all these products. And at the end of the day, I couldn't take the job. And it was a good job. I mean, it was a good offer. My wife would have killed to move back to Portland because I didn't like it. I didn't like eating it. It didn't, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm sorry. I'm a meat and potatoes guy, I guess, but I just couldn't see myself getting emotionally vested in selling that product. And it, it's why I, I went to soup business for some stupid reason. But, um, so you gotta understand who your consumer is and who your target market is and target in very, very closely. We have certain target groups within Johnny's that we know consume, a, 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 an African-American community consumes about three times the amount of seasoning salt that the others of us might consume, unless you live in Seattle. And uh, uh, so we, we target that market very specifically when we're going into new markets. We'll, we'll start with that core base of focusing upon our marketing efforts to and, and move it out from there. We do extremely well in the military communities. We do extremely well with, with like I say, we're, we're a blue collar, a uh, very, very strong brand in, in our niche, and we understand where our niche is, and we focus on our niche. We try not to get lost going out and chasing the next organic product that came along. We make some organic products, but they're within our niche. Third, you gotta have great people. People that work for me, some of them have been with me three, their third company maybe two or three times, and you gotta have people you can trust, and you gotta have people that share your vision. You've got to find people who have the same emotion as, as you do. Uh, Jimmy Starr, who's my sales manager, he started throwing groceries off the back of a distributor truck, you know, hauling around to stores. He gets what goes on in a grocery store better than anybody I've ever seen because he lived it. And, and you gotta find people who, who are emotional, who, who, who buy into your vision of the company. For Johnny's, our people, we just don't turn people over very often. We do not lose very many people because everybody's pretty bought in to, to what we're trying to do. We don't always get it done, but they're at least trying. The other thing I'm gonna tell you if you're running a business, the first time you think about firing someone, do it. Because you're gonna fire them eventually or they're gonna quit. Trust your instincts. I have had more people who I was gonna fix and save and help, and I knew I should have fired them, but I was, didn't want to be mean and ornery, and I ended up firing the most of them anyway, or they ended up quitting and they cost me a bunch of money. Don't ever forget that when you're running a business of your own. If you're running your own business, don't stick with people too long who aren't getting the job done. It sounds cruel, but you're really doing them a favor and yourself a favor. Because if they're not doing well in their job, they're probably not happy anyway, and they need to go find something to be happy about. But don't stick with bad people. It, it, you'll never fix them. Well, rarely. Innovation, you've gotta be innovating constantly. You, whatever your first item is, you already gotta have in your mind, where's your next step? Where's the next place I'm going? We probably say, I probably say, we cook every day at Johnny's or we, we're doing something. Now 99% of those would never get to the market but about one out of a hundred will actually make it through, but we're constantly working on new things. And it isn't just our one R&D guy, it's the people in the plant coming up with ideas, my wife, uh, coming up with ideas, but we're constantly looking for some type of innovation and in, in some of those things. Kind of a funny example of that is I was at Costco in Mexico, oh, about three weeks, a uh, month ago. We were talking and they said they wanted to see Asian salad dressings. They were looking for Asian type dressings for their dressing aisle. 
Week before that, I was in Kirkland with the international people, and Japan was looking for Mexican sauces. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, true story. <laughs> What I'm saying is the world's eating habits are coming together. You know, I call it fusion foods, you can call it whatever you want, but this intermixing of flavors and taking something and putting it together, it's all there. The, the Sriracha guy was in Irwindale, California when I lived there in the 80s. It was a little old plant out there, you know, and he'd been making his Sriracha. One day he woke up and the whole damn world was behind him. You know, everybody was eating Sriracha. Sometimes it takes a bit, but but new concepts, flavors, those are the, in our business where, where, the trend line, where the trend line is. And then you gotta be working on five or 10 things at the same time. You know, I always laugh when I heard the term multitasking. I multitasked when I first started in business because I had a red pen, a blue pen, a green pen, and a black pen, and I used different for different things. But that was long before I had a cell phone and all those kind of things. You got to be working on different things constantly all the time. Last couple. You know, you gotta think big, but act small. You have to dream, you have to have big ideas. The impossible is only that much harder than the unrealistic. It really is, it, it, it's not that hard. You know, and, and when people tell you they can't do something, sometimes you gotta look them in the eye and say, well, if you can't get it done, I'll find somebody else that can. Because you'll be amazed how many people can figure out how to get shit done when they feel a little threatened with their job. So you, you have to challenge people, you have to, you have to push the envelope. <laughs> And, and the reason I say act small, because you've got to spend your money, especially when you're in a small business, man, you've got to spend your money so carefully. You've got to spend it carefully. You can't afford to make mistakes. Big companies, yeah, I made my share of mistakes, I will say, and some of them were fairly good size, but none of them killed us. But in a small company, you make a big mistake, you're out of business. So spend carefully. You know, stay focused, be wary of rainbows. The last thing is, as a small business in our business and the way I looked at it when I ran Bear Creek and Johnny's is, I said, it's Campbell's job to bring people to the soup aisle. It's my job to steal them when they get there. <laughs> and as a small business, that's the way you have to think. Okay, I, it's not my job to go out and tell people to eat more spice. That's, can't, that's McCormick's job. They're, they're, they're supposed to bring people in the store. My job, and the only thing I can afford to do is attack them at the point of purchase, displays, shelf displays, stickers, promo, promo stuff, all kinds of ways that we can attack them on the street because the big companies are too lazy to do that. It's easier to go run a TV ad and give somebody a coupon than it is to go to a grocery store, set up. Any of you guys ever been in the back of a Walmart store? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a disaster. Trying to get your products from there to the shelf is, 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 is a battle within itself. I mean, you know, so you gotta, you, you, when you're running a, a small to mid-sized business, you gotta do it differently than the big guys. And the problem most big people have when they come to run smaller businesses is they, they think they still have the power of the big company behind them and they don't. And, and it, it's very difficult. Probably the last, well, two things, but the other one is leadership. You know, anybody can manage a company when things are going well. It's not hard. It's managing it when the times are tough. And if you're gonna run a business, especially a smaller business, you better be a decision maker. You cannot procrastinate. We, we don't have committees at Johnny's. Let me be real clear on that. We take input, we have feedback, but somebody, as George Bush once said, has to be the great decider. And, and at Johnny's, our, our approach is very direct. We don't fool around. We either try it or we don't and we move on. It's okay to be wrong. It is so okay to be wrong, just know when to cut your losses and move on. Don't stick with a dead horse. People want to be led. People like being led. I believe that. The other thing I'll say is delegation is a way overrated concept. Okay, Delegate. But if you delegate and then you don't follow up, that's your failure, not the person you delegated to. Just remember that. Because delegation without, without following up and taking control can be a very, very weary road. And everybody always wants to preach delegation, and yes, you need to delegate, but you need to keep control if you're running the company. The last thing is, the last couple things, cash flow. Cash flow is the lifeblood of your business. I get a report every morning at 7.30 a.m. It's our daily cash flow report. 
tells us our cash, our position, where we're at with the bank, how much credit we have available, what money we're expecting in this week, what bills we're expecting to pay this week. Every day. Dan has it out by about 7.30 in the morning. It is crucial you understand your cash flow and manage your cash flow. The cash is the lifeblood of your business. Anybody that wants to give you money is not your friend. Remember that. The bank is not your friend. Sorry, Tom, he was in the business. <laughs> Bank's your friend when you're making money. Bank's not your friend when things go tough, okay? Equity investors want to give you money. They want to make a living off of your work. Don't give up your equity cheap. Don't take money unless you absolutely need it because they're not your friend. I don't care what they say. I am an investor in some businesses, okay? I'm in it to make money off of somebody else's labor. Uh, I have investors in my business who are the same way. Just be very careful taking cash from people. Um, the, the last thing I, I kind of leave you with before we have successes is, and actually this comes from the guy who, uh, everybody's familiar with Walgreens, I'm sure, in the corner store, and Jordan, um, he was the CEO of Walgreens for 30 years. Started out working as a pharmacist, worked his way up, and. He told me this a long time ago, and it stuck with me in that in business, you crawl, you walk, then run. And the example he used of what that meant was back in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, Walgreens came up with the concept of the corner store, the typical Walgreens store you see. And they built one store like that. They had at the time, I think, around 1,000 stores, eight, 900 different store formats around the country. And they built one store and they brought consumers in and they looked at it and then they built two more. Brought consumers in, looked at it, then they built 10, then they built 4,000 in a 20 year period, 15 year period. Crawl, walk, run. Once you figure out what your concept is, once you figure out who your consumer is, once you figure out what your target is, pound it. Don't hesitate, don't be be, we just go out and pound it and stick with it, but test it first. Crawl, walk, run. It's a, it's a good analogy to remember as you're looking in your business. Don't try to get ahead of yourself. I, I work with a guy whose favorite motto is shoot, ready, aim. And, and he's a very difficult guy. He's a smart guy, but he's a difficult guy because he's out here shooting before we even took aim over here and, and what you're doing. So once you got something that's working, though, go like hell with it. Don't, don't wait because your competition will be there. They'll jump on it if it's a good idea and do that. And, and at Johnny's, the, my kind of example of that is, is we, we focus on our seen to sell business new markets. And it's a little bit this thing I talked about with the African-American consumer or certain consumer bases who, who are heavy users of our product. When we go into the market, you know, we, we go in in a big, in a, in a, in a very focused, intense way to, to use, to start turning that around. And, and we try to do things from a marketing perspective that are, you know, w we do the different stuff than what other people do. We're involved in toy drives and shoe drives and things that help the community. We're involved in, uh, we did the African American Rodeo in uh, Oakland, California. We did a big event there. You know how many people at the African American Rodeo in Oakland? Almost 20,000. Didn't even know it existed, I gotta be honest with you. We're doing Denver here in the spring. We do um, uh, other events like that. We have our, what we call the Johnny's Food Truck. We have a truck and a trailer that these two girls uh, drive around for us, Amy and Heather. Most amazing people you ever meet. I, I, if you ever see them around with the truck, you gotta stop and talk to them because they're just dynamic people. But we do store events. We do football game tailgate parties once in a while. We do, um, uh, we go to corporate offices. So we went to Kroger's office. We were just in Safeway Bellevue and we feed the whole office lunch one day. We pull up outside and feed them lunch. And, and we go to, uh, we've been to Kroger's, Walmart's, Albertsons, Safeways, all those places. So, so we do all these things that gives us an opportunity to interact with our customers on a close one-on-one -on -one basis. And that does two things for us. One, obviously we're using it to build our brand and drive sales and hand out samples. But it also gives us instant consumer feedback on concepts we're looking at. So if we're looking at something new, we, we happen to have a new product, we'll talk about a second, seasoned pepper. 
you know, that's where we kind of test it out and see if it's really working. Do people really like this? Is it really something they're looking for? And it's a very inexpensive, you know, by traditional marketing standards, it, it's not expensive. It's, it's much cheaper than, than other marketing efforts. You might do TV, radio, those kind of things. But for us, it's very effective because we want to be the altar. We want to be the other guy. We want to be the guy doing strange things. Uh, they did an event somewhere on Halloween and they were all dressed up. I mean, it, it, we, we do a lot of that kind of stuff that, that's a little off the beaten path. But, but that's in our business, that's how you have to succeed when you're up against behemoth competitors. I mean, the competitors in our industry, McCormick's a $6 billion company. I, I don't have to tell you, most of our competitors are very big, well-heeled companies. Not very well managed, but most of them have a lot of money. So we, we try to do just the opposite of what they do, something different. And when you're looking at your business, think about what you can do to stand out. How can you be different? Test it, test it again. If it works, go with it. That, that's my one piece of advice. So with that, um, I, I don't have a lot of other things uh, I, I probably to add, and I open it up to any questions anybody has or anything, comments or those things. Yes, sir. Could you just give a generalized, for a manufacturing company in the food business, mm -hmm. what's an acceptable cost of goods sold percentage? I always look, if I'm in the retail grocery business, and I look at it differently by channel of trade. Retail grocery, I want about a 60% gross margin, maybe 65. If I'm in the club store business with people like Costco and Sam's, I'm probably trying to get 40 and getting 35 if I'm lucky. Um, but it, it does, you know, it is a little different by business. And the reason your retail business has to be higher is because you're going to spend more money marketing against it than, than, than you do in the other avenues. The one thing I'll, I'll say is that most people who get in the grocery business, I have people come to me constantly who got a great product. I got Aunt Lily's chocolate chip cookies, and they're the best cookies. In the Everybody out there's got a great product. There's lots of great products. The retailer doesn't care. He's renting a shelf space, basically. Now, you need his support, as I was telling someone earlier. But the retailer really, he, 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 everything comes in probably tastes good, or, or a lot of it. Yet what most people don't understand is the distribution channel to get you to the retail consumer. Because you can go through a DSD system, which is direct store door delivery. You can go through a distributor, a specialty distributor. Well, he's going to mark you up 30%. You're going to have a higher retail price. You've got to have a special price list for him that's directed. Or you can go direct to warehouse, which is the best way to go, except then they're going to probably want you to pay slotting at between five dollars and $20,000 an item. So each one has its pros and cons, and you have to figure out what's best for your business. And, and can you achieve the retail price point you need and the margin you need to be successful? Most people get into business, they've underpriced their product or they don't really understand what their cost is. Then they go out and s the retailer beats them up, they sell it too cheap, and all of a sudden they've worked their tail off, they're trying to get a business going and they're not making any money. And then they come and say, well, you know, help me make some money. Well, it's too late then. You've already set the price point in the marketplace. It's very hard to say, hey, I'm going to double this or triple this. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's a very... If you're going to launch something in the grocery business, sit down and talk with somebody that's in the business who understands the business really well because setting your initial price point is crucial in determining if you're going to be able to make money. A lot of good products out there don't make any money. I sold a lot. Of them, trust me. I know. Personal experience. <laughs> well, we, had a, you know, we couldn't get a big enough truck. I used to be in the bean oil business selling commodities. You know, you, you can't get a big enough truck to make any money at a quarter of a cent a pound. Yes, sir. Yeah, for, for Johnny's, uh, what is the ideal uh, retail outlet for you folks? Is it, is, is it a grocery store chain like Kroger, or, or is it Costco, or is it individual stores? That, uh... Well, we, we sell them all. If you ask me who my favorite customer in the world is, it's probably Walmart. Yeah. They're the worst to do business with, but yeah. they do move volume. Yeah. Um, but we sell uh, we retail grocery chains and or independents, people like SARS or um, uh, Thriftway, those people. I mean, we, we do business with any type of retail chain. Bartels. <laughs> What's that? 
Bartels. Yep, we sell bar your product. We do. We sell the We sell Bartels. We sell a chain, and you'll laugh about this, but everybody, anybody ever heard of Fred's? Yeah. Fred's on a someplace in Memphis, Tennessee. They're basically kind of a drugstore, grocery, dollar store type concept. You know how many stores Fred's has? 650. In every little town in Tennessee and Kentucky and northern Mississippi and northern Alabama, there's a Fred's store. I'll guarantee you. And, and hey, Fred's buys truckloads of merchandise. They never take a discount. They pay on time. They're a great customer. Most people never heard of them, but now we give them a pretty good deal. But, you know, it, you got to look for those channels where, where you can reach your target consumers. And again, for us, that's traditional retail grocery, certainly Costco. I mean, we do a lot of business with Costco. We do well with Costco, and we have a very good relationship with Costco. Johnny Seasoning Salt's item number with Costco is number 30. Jim Senegal personally used Johnny Seasoning Salt. He wanted it in his first store, and it was in there. So. Why hasn't Costco reverse engineered your product? You know, they, 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 you know, certain brands, you know, that's the difference between the brand and the, the, the label. And we're not big enough, even though we do a nice business with Costco and Sydney Salt, we're not like, you know, I don't know, pepper, you know, I mean, or salt. Uh, uh, we're a niche product. And so, we try to keep ourselves below the radar. We really do. Um, they, they have actually an item. They've put it in before, but it's never sold. And, and, and it's, it's the only place I ever see it anymore is up in Eastern Canada. But um, they have a seasoning salt they made under Kirkland Signature, but it's one, it's not very good. And two, well, personal opinion. And um, two, it's just never caught fire because of kind of our position in the marketplace here. And I think Costco does like to support local companies. You have to understand, for a business like Johnny's, Costco needs us for innovation. They don't need us to sell them product. They can buy it cheaper from McCormick or Lipton or Campbell. They can get a better deal. They'll write a million dollar checks. What they need people like Johnny's for is we keep bringing them new stuff. Sometimes they get tired of seeing us and we're throwing out, but you know, we're always bringing them something and then every once in a while you hit, you know, you hit something that works. But just remember, these guys need small businesses for innovation. Big companies don't innovate, big companies buy. I mean, Beatrice, we bought brands and businesses. We didn't really go out and start them because it's too expensive and it's too much risk. It's much easier to go buy somebody else out and then kill it because that's what most people do, but it, it works for the guy selling, let me tell you. Um, uh, so so I, I think, you know, you got to remember what your role is sometimes within the, the customer's mind, not what you want to do, but what do they want from you. And for us, it's innovation with Costco. That's really our key. As long as we keep doing our job, they kind of leave us somewhat alone. It, Costco is a very difficult customer. So you said uh, you're always innovating, uh, setting the trends, but also you, at the beginning you said it's important to stay within the core business mm -hmm. and, uh, and to know where your core business is. So how do you balance the two? Innovation yeah. and staying in the core business? Yeah, I, well, the, 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 I knew somebody was going to ask that question when I wrote it down. I appreciate that. You know, w w what I look at when I look at it is, you know, I, I'm a salesman at heart. I'm a peddler. Anytime I go look at something, I get a new idea. I'm always flying off, and everybody who works for me knows, unless Kevin asked for it three times, don't even bother farting around because it was probably just his new idea today, and it'll die tomorrow. But, but what I mean by that is you can't just sit. Uh, you, you, you got a product. You got a product that's successful, like this product here, and we're doing well, and we just did a relabel job on it a couple years ago, and we do these things. This is our core, this is our focus, this is our heart, along with other things. But we constantly are looking for some way to expand something and bring something new to the party. Uh, we spent a couple years working on this product. We're rolling it out, you'll be seeing it in all the grocery stores here come springtime, or starting now, which is a seasoned pepper. It's the best damn pepper you've ever eaten. Use it on the stove. It's like a stovetop pepper. I'm not shitting when I say that. I'm serious. It's the best damn pepper you'll ever eat. It's a blend of some peppers, and it's made for really to be used on the stove. So, yeah, I'm staying focused on my seasoning salt, but, but the seasoning salt category is about $60 million, $65 million branded, $70 million. This is about $300 million. Okay, pepper's big item. And can we niche off 5% of that? 
Yeah, that's a good item. So I think you have to look, when I, when I say stay focused but, but keep innovating, how am I going to innovate within my, my segment? I'm not going to go out and get in the cookie business. Even though she's got the best cookie in the whole world, it doesn't fit what we do. As much as I might like it, I'm not going to go get in that business. But within my niche, I'm going to keep working on making things better. What can I do to make a better seasoning salt? What can I do to make a better seasoned pepper or whatever that item is? So it, it, it is a push and a pull there. There's a yin and a yang. And that's why you have to have, when I talked about people and people you can trust, <laughs> The people who work for me know, know well enough to know me that they can say, Kevin, you're just full of shit. You're way off base on this thing. Come on, get real. You know, and I go, okay, I guess so. You know, let's think about it. You gotta have people who, can, who you can bounce things off of who are honest with you, who are not afraid of you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, some, way too many managers manage by intimidation and then they don't get any feedback. Or worse yet, they hire people that are like them. That's a natural tendency. We all like to hire people we like, right? You gotta have some people you don't like. Or maybe you don't like, but my CFO Kenny is the, the strangest duck you've probably ever seen, but, but the guy is really good and he, and, you know, if I look at that bottle of water, it's, man, that baby's almost full. Kenny will look at it and say, nope, it's almost empty. There's that much gone out of it. You know, you, you need some people like that in your life around you to keep you realistic and those kind of things. Any other questions? Anything else? Yours, uh, la how long does a Johnny seasoning salt last? And so that, that's kind of a new problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if, you have, if you're selling lettuce, it goes bad in a week. Mm -hmm. But if someone buys a Johnny seasoning salt product, you know, they could have that in their cupboard for many, many months. Yeah. Um, so how does that affect your business versus? Uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's the biggest challenge we face. Okay, you ever seen them big jars we sell in Costco? Mm -hmm. yep. We call them legacy products. Because <laughs> they last you a lifetime. And, and uh, I don't know who uses those, I'll be honest to God, I still can't figure it out. But you know, I, we do, you know, it, it is an issue for us in that, in that if a consumer mm -hmm. uses one to three jars a year, a three jar a year, when I talk a heavy user, that's using two or three jars a year, not one. Coming back to my model where you got to, as you're going to grow your business, you, you, you've got to find other complementary things to help you, you grow with it. And you have to keep refreshing your own product. You have to keep looking at it, relabeling it, getting a new look, doing something different to remind people to buy you. I, I mentioned Walmart earlier, and, and this is my own personal frustration, but a year ago I pulled our Walmart numbers and the store here in Tacoma was like my 20th store in the country. I'm going, what the hell's going on? I mean, how can I have a wall? I had a Walmart store in Cheyenne, Wyoming, no, someplace in Wyoming, sold more product in the store in Tacoma, Washington. So I got a hold of the, went up to the district manager and I went up to the store and I, I figured it out quickly. We're always out of stock. We're never on the shelf. We're always out of stock, always. So I got to the district manager, they think I'm nuts, but I went to the stores and I made a deal with them and we put a rack up in that store. And I have a girl who goes once, twice a week and, and still we can't keep it full because we can't get product from warehouse half time, but that's another story. But, but Allie is, she's a great kid, she's tough, she speaks Spanish, she's, she's just a wonderful person. And, and, and we took that store from averaging about $200 a week per year, and we average over 500 now. Just because we're in stock. So when I say I like Walmart stores, you'll know why I say that, okay? Uh, but, uh, and now we're working with 10 stores, and my next goal is to work with 50, but I don't know how to do it yet. I haven't figured out how to get it done, but those are the things you gotta figure out. What, what's happening that's not allowing you to grow your business? What, what are you looking at? And, and the one thing you, in, in our business, data is important. You know, you, you gotta have you buy retail data. In grocery business, you can buy any data you want. I, I can buy data down to the, you know, how much you wanna spend is really the question. And a lot of it becomes kind of useless data, I think, it, you know, maybe if you're a big brand. But for us, we look at ACV, that, that's called all commodity volume in, in IRI terms. That means how many grocery stores are you in with at least one facing of product in the nation? And then the second thing we look at is volume, uh, what, what are we doing on regular retail price point, what do we do at promoted price? 
And which one of those, you know, we try two for five, do we try buck off, do we, you know, when, again, when we kind of find one we like, then we go out and pound the snot out of that in, in the marketplace. So, you know, there's no, I, I can't give you a mad, there is no magic answer, there really isn't. It's just, you know, you gotta, you just gotta keep working at it. You just gotta keep rolling the dice and keep, keep working at it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So given your history and your other experiences with business, what attracted you to Johnny's that you wanted to work with Johnny's? Well, there was, there was three reasons. Yeah, and, uh, you know, everything with me kind of comes off the cuff, I have to be honest with you, but number one, I had sold Bear Creek. We had a soup company. Everybody, everybody ever seen Bear Creek soup mix in the bag? We bought that company in 2000, myself and a couple other investors. That's what took me to Utah. The plant was in Heber City. And we sold that in 2006 and did quite well with it. And I had a non-compete for a couple years. So I have a real estate project in Park City, some other things. But I realized that I was 50 at the time, maybe 55, something like that. I don't know. And, and everybody I knew was in the food business, and, and I wasn't anymore. My friends, you, when you started a business, an industry, you, you develop a, a social culture that goes with it as well as a business culture. And, and you know, when you're either in or you're out. You know, I'd call my buddy, I'm like that Peyton Manning commercial. I'd call him, say, let's go to lunch. And they go, we're working. You know, so, so. After a couple of years, I was like, God, I'm looking for something. And I happened to be at a Costco appointment once in Northern California in 2005, maybe. And I met this lady there by the name of Lisa Sabura. She was the sales manager for Johnny's. And I was in, in Costco back then. They didn't have separate rooms. You would be like in the kitchen preparing your stuff. And somebody else is over here doing a presentation. And the buyer there was a guy by the name of Stephen Frank. He's retired now, thank God. But he was a miserable, tough guy. <laughs> And I'm watching this gal, this lady, and, and she's got Stephen like right around her finger. She's doing and they're laughing. And I'm going, you know, I don't see that very often. And I called on Stephen for a long time. So she finished and left. We did our presentation with Stephen, you know, got the usual chick, your boot kicking. And um, then we did okay. And I'm walking up parking lot. She was loading stuff in her car. And I just went over and I said, hey, I don't know who you are, or what you do, but I said, that was a really good presentation because I've been around a long time and, and I met that. And so she was like, oh, thank you so much, nice. When you come to Seattle, she gave me her card and those things. So that's how we met. And we talked and I came up and visited with them. We were looking at some acquisitions and I'm always looking at companies. And this is the part I probably shouldn't say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You know, salt sells for about 25 cents a pound, 30 cents a pound. Salt. Seeding salt sells for about $2.50 a pound. Seeding salt's about 90% salt. Okay, let's just be right up front. I'm not very smart, but I looked at it and said, oh, I kind of like this industry. This looks pretty good, you know. I, I'm in, that's how I ended up buying Bear Creek. I got to look and I go, this bag sells for four bucks. There's no more than 50 cents worth of crap in that bag. There's got to be something here. And, and so, you know, one thing kind of led to another, and, and at the time they weren't interested in selling, but we always maintained a dialogue. And when John decided he wanted to sell the business, he called me up one day and said, hey, like so, so that was in 2009. <laughs> like, go try to raise money in 2009, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> nobody would give you a nickel to walk across the street. So we putzed around for almost two years before I found an investor. Our, our primary investor is a company out of Seattle called Laird Norton. Laird Norton Foundation, if any of you know of them, they're a, a big family. Yeah, basically it's all the old Weyerhaeuser family money and uh, it's a managed foundation, but they have about a, they have a private equity group where they do some private equity. It's called Winona Capital and it's actually out of Chicago and that's who our, my partners are in this particular, this particular deal. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up with Johnny. I mean, it was no rock, you know, I didn't sit around and look, say oh, this is what I really want to do or analyze. I looked at it, I looked at the business, I looked at the customers, I saw the feel, and I said, I think this business can be probably has a lot more potential than what it has. John and Bill, good people, liked them dearly, but their goal in life was to go to Alaska and build cabins, which seems to be a lot of people from Seattle think that way. I don't, I don't get it, because I've been to Alaska a few times, but, and I like going there, but I don't want to live there. And so they would take every dime they could get out of the business and go buy property in Alaska or build a cabin. and. and our approach is different. We're brand builders. Our goal is to, to build the brand to a certain level, and at some point we will exit the business, uh, probably, more than likely. We don't have a timeline. We don't have a date, but 
you know, I'm 64. I don't know how much longer I'm going to, you know, probably, you know, another four or five years, I'll probably get tired of doing this and have to go do something else. I don't know. This is probably going to be the last company I, I run. I'll say that probably. I don't know that I'd take another, another, another one on, you know. So there's no succession planning for the, for the business? Are your kids going to take it over? No. I keep telling my kids, don't go in the food business, man. <laughs> go find a real job. Um, I have a son who's in business school at the University of Utah and another one at the University of Arizona. And, um, yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're, I told both of them, go find a real job. Don't go to work in the food business. When you're a soup peddler, you know, you feel like, you know you're right about there at the bottom of the list, you know, when you're peddling soup. So, so those things. Um, what else? Any other questions I can answer for you? Can you talk about your market research? You mentioned uh, a couple times about the African American uh, demographics. How do you, do you have an in-house R and D market well, research? Well, yeah, we, we, we have. Well, one we have. We, we use kind of. We have an in-house R and D guy. I mean, we have people, our plant people, work on new products in R and D. But the market research really. Jeff Hansen, who's my marketing director, and, and he's been with me a couple times here. He, we spent time doing some consumer focus groups and some consumer work, and I don't know if any of you ever heard of a brand called Lowry's. <laughs> well, the ex-CEO of Lowry's happens to be a guy I know. And Lowry's was sold to Unilever back in the, I don't know, 2001 or 2002, and then it was um, sold again to McCormick a few years later, but John's a really good guy. And uh, so I called him up and put him on our board because those guys spent more money on research than we would spend in a lifetime. So most of the research I stole from them, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> that particular piece about African Americans. But, um, you know, we, we do research. We, we do, you know, there, there's plenty of resources out there. You don't always have, you know, today with the internet and these things, there, there's a lot of research out there you can do along the way in researching markets and share and those kind of things. We put a lot of energy into that. I do, Jeff does. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time, time looking at it. The, the one thing you have to be careful of is, you, you know, the world is in a position of, of way over analysis. We way over analyze things. People get so petrified of the data they can't make decisions. We see it all the time in our business, especially with buyers. It used to be I walked into Fred Meyer, I said, hey, I want to do four, let's do a deal. And I was selling margarine, I sold golden soft margarine. I'd say, you know, hey, I'll give you six trucks, we'll run them three for a buck. Boom. We walked out of there with a purchase order years ago. When I first called on Costco, you'd walk out with a purchase order in your hand. Nowadays, it takes you six months, eight months, a year for the committee to make a decision, and they got to have the review, and they're not selling any more groceries. Now they sell four trucks instead of six trucks because they, they don't know what the ad point should be. I mean, it, it's tough. It's tougher now than it used to be. But my point of all that is, again, in, in business, I, I think people get way... You know, make sure you understand what the important data is and what's unimportant. I talked to you about the cash flow report I get in the morning. Every afternoon, it's, we close at 4 o'clock our offices. At 3.45, I get a report that shows all the new orders that came in today, everything that's shipped today, where we're at month to date, where we're at here, what our inventory is, what our receivables are, what our payables are, all on one sheet of paper. And with that, those two reports are the only two reports I use to run my business that I get every day. That doesn't mean I don't ask for something, and yes, we do financial statements at the end of the month. Financial statements only tell you what you did last month, what your trend line is, but they ain't going to tell you what you're doing now. They're not going to tell you what's coming out now. Don't, don't worry. You know, you got to make money. I, money is the measurement of what you do. You're not in business to make money. You're in business to provide a product, a service, a need for the consumer, making money is your measurement, a yardstick of how well you're doing that. Don't forget that. If you don't believe in your product, you, don't, you go into business to make money, you're going to make a mistake. Making money is the result of your efforts. It's not your goal. It's not your goal. Now, we all need enough to live, and I understand all that, but you really, you have to believe in your product and you're providing something bigger than just you making money. That's what guys that want to give you money do. Money guys are funny people. They really are. Tom will tell you. You know, because they all think they know everything, but none of them want to do anything. They want to tell you how you should do it. 
trust me, I've dealt with private equity guys, I've dealt with people. They all want to tell you what you're doing wrong, and they all were experts probably once in their life, but I don't know. I mean, you know, go out and sit in front of the customer and then tell me something. You know, go, go up here to Seattle, call on, go to Kirkland, call on Costco, and then go in and tell me what I should sell them, okay? You know, go, 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 go call on a real customer and then come back and tell me, you know, what I should go do. Because unless you're out there on the front lines, unless you're calling on people, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You just think you know. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, something that's really interesting is the guts that it takes. You know, you're talking about small business, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because I imagine that the businesses that sell salt are just these huge corporations, right? Cargill. And, and so, so Morton. Do, you ever just, do you ever just get that, that feeling that is just you know, because I wonder if they uh, threaten, you yeah. know, the seasoning salt business, and yeah. how, sure. how do you how do you deal with that? They're all in the business. The, the two advantage, well, you have to figure out what your competitive advantage is. One great product. Two, we do all the things that they don't do because they're lazy. In my opinion, you know, they want to manage from up here at fifty thousand feet. They don't want to go out and get in a grocery store and figure out why I'm not selling in the Walmart store in Chehalis, Washington or Tacoma. So that's one. Secondly, you poke an elephant in the butt, but you don't poke him in the eye. Always remember that. You know, you poke the elephant in the butt, he might swish his tail, but he isn't going to do that. You poke him in the eye, you're, you're, that, that's probably going to be a bad day. So you have to be smart about you know, you don't go out and poke people that are bigger than you, you know, you just don't go poke people bigger than smoke, bigger than, bigger than the eye. You know, you keep chipping away at them. You bite the apple one bite at a time, I guess is the old saying. And you have to be resourceful. You have to, you have to think through the complication of your action. If I'm going to go tick them off, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And when that reaction happens, it can be very painful. So one, I, I would say first of all, you, you got to do the things they can't. You, you got to be more passionate than they are. You got to work harder. And two, be smart about it. Don't don't go do things that just irritate them because it makes you feel good. I I love ticking them off. You know that makes me feel good, but it's probably not good for my business, and it's probably not smart. So, I mean, I, a lot of times I look to make my you know what's that old saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer, or something like that. You know, I try to know my competitors. I, I try to tell them how poor we're doing all the time. and how We're just barely, just, I'm just this farm boy from Wisconsin, which is really true. Uh, and so I'm always trying to convince them that, you know, we're, 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 we're not really competition. We want to be your friend. And so, you, you know, you, you got to be smart. I, I think in industries, I think when you get into technology industries and other things, there's probably a whole other set of dynamics that come to play uh, because speed is so important. Speed to the market is so important. In our business, it's more about being right. Um, you know, don't don't get caught up in don't be fast to be wrong. I mean, but you now some industries that that's that's different. Um, I guess I I don't know. You know, it's it, it's it's doing that, but. You know, running a small business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to run a business, small business, even larger business, you know, there are a lot of sleepless nights. A lot of sleepless nights. One other quick story, but in the soup business with Bear Creek, when we bought the company, we, it was in bankruptcy, basically. It was in, uh, not kind of like, not Chapter 11, but the bank was taking it over. Long, huge, long story of, you know, people spending money foolishly, but... And we bought it from the bank and, and our investors. And the soup business is kind of interesting because about 65, 70% of your sales take place between the 1st of September and 1st of the year. You may eat soup all winter, but you buy soup because Campbell's has taught you for years to buy soup in October, November, right? Soup is good for you, soup month, you know, I don't know what it is. So you build inventory all summer to have it ready to sell because when you're selling, you've got to be able to push it out there and keep it going. But in the middle of June, it's, you know, 1st of July in the soup business, you know, you're, uh, I always said you always look to back the car up and put the exhaust pipe in the window because, you know, you're watching the cash go like this and the inventory go like this. And 
when I first got there, my CFO came in. He said, God, you know, we're going to run out of money. I just know we are, Al Van Loon. I said, here. I, said, here. I wrote him a $50,000 check, and I told him, put it in his top desk drawer, and if he, he ever needed it to make payroll, that check was there. Now, I never told him I didn't have the money in the bank to cover it. <laughs> but he settled down. It made him feel better. And, and, you know, there were a lot of times when we said, he'd come in and say, I don't know. I said, we're going to get paid. Trust me, we're going to get some money before Friday. And we always did, somehow. But my, my point of all that is, you've you got to know where you're at. You've got to know what you're doing. But you do also have to have, you know, some gut right here. You have to have some, some intuitiveness. You've got to have some stick-to-itiveness. That's why I say it's always easy to manage when things are going well. What people look to is who manages when things are going tough. When you have a product problem, do you do the right thing or the wrong thing? You know, the other thing I tell you is always do the right thing. Deep down inside, you probably know what the right thing is. And as many times as I've anguished over not wanting to do it, in the end, it always pays off better. If we have a problem with a product or a customer, I don't send my sales guy in to tell the account. I fly and walk in and say, hey, we screwed up. What do you want me to do about it? That's all I can do is try to fix it. It's our fault. You know, don't send somebody else to do your dirty work. Don't. That's just chicken manure. You know, do your own dirty work. I'll tell you that too. People respect it. Customers respect it immensely. I always watch these deals like this Volkswagen. You know, they just can't come out and say we screwed you. If they would just do that, people would forgive them. But no, they all try to cover it up. They all try to hide it out. The airbag. I mean, it, you watch it time and again, time and again. And you go, you know, somebody knew that. Somebody knew they were doing it 10 years ago. Come on, don't, don't tell me somebody didn't know. Somebody at a high level. Okay, you did the wrong thing and you got caught. You paid the price. Now it's costing you $15 billion. I mean, you know, do the right thing. It, it's not so hard usually. It takes a little more work, but it's not so hard. Comes back a little bit to that sentence, you know, Try to do the impossible, but be sure when you get there, you really can do it. <laughs> okay, anything else from anyone? I don't want to. I have one last question. If okay. Else has one. My question is, when you buy and sell your, your companies and businesses, what are you looking for from the buyer? I mean, as far as keeping the legacy and the culture going uh, within the organization? And the community? Well, I guess two things. First of all, when you're looking at acquiring business, I've bought 15, 16 businesses over the years. Um, you're going to look at about 100 companies to buy one, maybe 50, okay? And so you're going to look at a lot. If you want to go out and buy businesses, you're going to look at a lot. The three things I look for are probably the things I look for is products. Do they have a product that I have faith in? Do we have a product? Do we have something to sell? Two. Chances are when you walk into a business and a plant, some have a certain feel and some don't. Is it clean? Do people look like they enjoy working there? Are they busy? Are people strolling around, you know, doing this or are they really focused on working? There's a feel. There's something about a business that's usually doing probably successful or has the potential to do successful in the people. And, and so you, you kind of get a feel for that. And, and then third, what's the, mar you know, what's the market potential for this business? And, and I go back to Bear Creek, and it's what sold the previous owners. Is th this was a brand. This lady started it selling at little fairs and stuff because she needed money. Actually, it was from Washington. There's a Bear Creek up near Redmond, Washington somewhere because that's where she actually started it, Sheila White. And then they moved to Utah, and they went from... 2 million to 5 million to 10 million to 15 million. I got a big order from Costco. And, and her son sat down and drew a piece of paper and said, well, geez, we did two, we must be going to $100 million. And they went out and built a plant, do $100 million worth of business, 150,000, 60,000 square feet in Utah. Nobody ever stopped and said the whole dry soup category is only 70 some million dollars. <laughs> but they're part of the category. Bank gave them money, you know, they, life was good. They went and bought ranches in Montana, and Don wanted to be a cattle farmer, and yeah, three, two years later, they were in bankruptcy. Because they didn't look and say, what's my, you know, what's realistic for this business? How big can I actually take this business? And, you know, you, you, so, so a lot of it is understanding what the market potential is. You know, Johnny's never gonna be a $200 million business. 
get it to 30 or 40, we'd be thrilled to death. We'd have people lined up out the street to buy us out. We have people now call one and buy it, but we're not interested. But there's kind of breaks in businesses in our industry, and again, I can't speak for others, but you know, 25 million in revenue, then you start, you know, people start looking. 15, yeah, you're okay, but your multiple jumps two times. 50 million, now you're talking about, you know, gaining business. 100 million dollar brand is a huge brand. Huge, I mean, a very good brand, very worthwhile to sell. So, I don't know, when I look at businesses, it's, it, a lot of it's about the people and, you know, but product, people, brand. It, it's a lot of it's gut feel. You know, a lot of it's what do you like? What, what, what interests you personally? What fits in your strategic mix of what you want to? We're constantly looking for an acquisition. We just haven't found one in the last five or six years that fits with what we do. But we're, we'd love to buy something. We, we have the resources to buy it. We just haven't found something that fits what, what we want to do right now. And I've probably been less, a uh, little less, I haven't been looking as hard, I will say, as I probably was when I was younger. Any more questions? Anybody? Well, thank okay. you. Okay. Got some samples here. Now, last thing. Friends, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, mothers, you know, everybody should know, you know, tell them about Johnny's. Tell them about Johnny's. <laughs> tell them about Johnny's. Our best ambassadors are our customers. Word of mouth goes further than anything else in the food business, let me tell you.